So the title of my talk was Yearning to Breathe Free, which is a phrase that comes from the, the poem by Emma Lazarus that's at the base of the Statue of Liberty, which was given to us as a donation, um, given to us to honor the 100th anniversary of the founding of the United States, 1776, the Declaration of Independence. The French were going to give it to us in 1876, but we had to put up the, the base of the statue. So it took us about 10 years to, to raise the money and put up the base, and um, the Statue of Liberty went up in 1886. So I just wanted to read you that poem very quickly. Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame with conquering limbs astride from land to land, here at our sea-washed sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch whose flame is the imprisoned lightning and her name, Mother of Exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. Her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that twin cities frame. Keep ancient lands, your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these the homeless tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. So this is where I took my title from, Yearning to Breathe Free. And I just want to give you a very quick overview of immigration, the history of immigration in US history. I teach American civilization, you know, survey course that zips through the history of it. And so I figured we could just zip through the history of it tonight, um, assuming complete ignorance on the part of the audience. So. Um, <laughs> so excuse me if this is a, a narrative that you know very well, right? Um, so I usually look at the history of immigration in three stages, right? And my question for tonight is whether there really is a third stage um, or whether there's really only two stages. Um, so the first stage of American immigration um, comes from the immigrants who we're fleeing the rise of the British Empire, right? So for the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, all of our immigration was primarily coming from the British Isles. There was a little bit of immigration from Germany, um, but the majority because um, Hanover um, was, was held by the British king, and so they had easy access to the British colonies. Um, but primarily, um, immigration to the North, to the North American um, colonies were from the British Isles, right? Um, now, there's a trajectory from the 1600s into the 1700s, right? A trajectory which is common to all of American immigration, it, which is that the immigrant groups got larger and larger and poorer and poorer. That's the tendency with American immigration, is that the immigrant groups get larger and larger and poorer and poorer, right? Um, so the immigrants in the 1600s were mostly English. The Puritans, who were supporters of the Puritan majority in Parliament, um, the Cavaliers or Royalists, and then nonconformists who, dis who um, disagreed with the established church. They refused to be part of either the Anglican Church, um, the established church for England, or the Presbyterian Church, was, which was the established church for Scotland. Um, so there's this trajectory of the growth of the British Empire, right? 1500s, you have merry old England, right? Little England, a small island nation, right? Uh, merry old England, right? Um, just a single kingdom under the Tudors, right? And it's not until 1603 that you have the creation of the United Kingdom, the United Kingdom of England and Scotland. I'm looking at Ross Snyder there, who's in my AMCIV class. Yes, we've just gone over this, right? Um, so you have this new beast created in 1603, this new invention, the United Kingdoms of England and Scotland, right? A consolidation of the creation of a multinational state, right? Um, throughout the 1600s, you have a power struggle between the king and the parliament, and the parliament wins, beheading the king in the English Civil War, and then deposing the king in the English Glorious Revolution. So it's very clear who's getting the upper hand in the struggle between the king and the parliament. And by 1707, the parliament is able to place the Hanovers on the throne um, essentially as a figurehead of the power of parliament. And the English parliament eats up the Scottish parliament, dissolves the Scottish parliament, and brings into the English parliament 
um, all of the representatives from the Scottish Parliament. Um, so you have the creation of Great Britain, no longer simply um, united in the person of the king, no longer simply a multinational state, but by 1707, Great Britain, a consolidated state where all of the real power is in the hands of a single body, the parliament. And after that, they're able to maintain a standing army. They're able to maintain a large taxation bureaucracy. They're really heading in the direction of becoming one of the first modern states, right? So this is rather typical, right, is that we get immigration from the rise of a modern consolidated state, right, which is gaining in its ability to tax its people, gaining in its ability to control its borders, gaining in its ability to exercise um, military power. Um, so you have little England, right, little feudal England with many parliaments and right, the king and Magna Carta, separation of, of church and state, religious liberty for the church, right, you get consolidation of power when the king becomes the, the head of the Church of England, the act of supremacy, further consolidation of power with um, the creation of the United Kingdom, further consolidation of power with the invention of the great British Parliament, mother of all parliaments, including both the, the English and the Scottish Parliament in one, in one parliamentary body in 1707, the Act of Union, the creation of Great Britain. So you have this trajectory of increasing power Right. until after the French and Indian War, Great Britain goes up against the only other um, aspirant to being a world power, uh, the French, um, and essentially defeats the French in North America, in um, the Indian subcontinent, and defeats them both in Asia and in North America to become the first empire in which the sun never set. Right? So with this trajectory, right, the rise of the British Empire, at every stage of that trajectory, Different groups are thrown off who object to this increase of power, right? Puritans object to the increase of power of the king. Then when the Puritans in Parliament get an upper hand, the, um, the royalists object to the power accumulation in Parliament, right? The nonconformists object to the state's power over the church, right? And then once their Parliament is dissolved, the Scots object to the dissolution of their Parliament by the great British Parliament at Westminster. And so at every stage in the accumulation of power in the state, you have groups of people who are thrown off, who emigrate, um, and who come to North America, right? So you have this, this, um, dual, this dual picture, right? Where the European nation is becoming increasingly centralized and consolidated and more powerful Right? Every Western civilization textbook has a chapter entitled The Rise of the Modern Nation State. Right? Um, so this trajectory is right, not surprising. Right? Um, from merry old England to the United Kingdom to Great Britain to the first empire in which the sun never set. Right? This um, trajectory of the rise of power. Right? And what do we have in terms of immigration to the new world, but people who are objecting to that rise in various and sundry ways. Right? Um, they're yearning to breathe free. Right, um, this is the this is the character of American immigration. Is that we usually tend to get people who object to the rise of state power elsewhere, right? Um, so, the Puritans, Cavaliers, Nonconformists, and the Scots, right? That's a trajectory of larger and larger and larger groups, poorer and poorer and poorer groups, right? Um, mostly English immigration during the, during the 1600s, mostly Scottish immigration during the 1700s, once the Scottish Parliament has been dissolved and, and the Scots object to that, right? So mostly English um, immigration and then mostly Scottish immigration. And of course, the English are horrified that the Scots are coming over. Um, the, Engli the Scots don't live under, um, under English common law. They don't speak English. Um, they are mostly Presbyterian. Um, they live in clans, right? They're so the, there's a great eagerness on the part of the English who have filled up the Eastern seaboard for the Scots to move west. They don't allow the Scots to be part of the colonial militias. Um, it's actually George Washington who first allows Scots, the new immigrants, to be part of the colonial militias, starting a, another great 
um, trend in American immigration history that the way you become Americanized is that you participate in a war, right? Um, so the Scots become Americans by participating in the American Revolutionary War. The Irish become Americans by participating in the American Civil War. The Italians become Americans by participating in World War I, right? Um, African Americans become Americans by participating in World War II, right? This is um, the process of, of Americanization usually comes through participation in the armed forces in, in, one, of our, um, in one of our wars. So the Scots start that tradition, right? They're not allowed into colonial militia, uh, militias. They're seen as foreign immigrants. Um, and you know there are, there are laws keeping Scots out of the colonial parliaments, whatever. So they're, the Scots are the original foreign immigrant body that we have, right? Um, but as soon as, after the American um, Revolution, as soon as the Irish start coming over, partly because the British have then dissolved the Irish Parliament and included the Irish in the great British Parliament, the mother of all parliaments, and so the Irish are being thrown off by the growth of the British, uh, the British Empire, right? Um, so all of our immigrants, English, Scottish, and Irish, are originally coming over because of the rise of the British Empire, right? Um, they come over in e even larger numbers and are even poorer, right? Um, so if the, if the English were wealthy enough um, to purchase land in the eastern seaboard, in the Piedmont, the, the, um, the fertile land um, between the Appalachian Mountains and the Atlantic, the Scots are forced to move across the Appalachian um, Mountains into the west, right, further west looking for land, and the Irish are so poor that they can't even go and purchase land in the west. They just get jobs right there in the port, in the, in the towns. There are first urban immigration, right? Um, the Scots move west. You get Scots in Georgia and Scots in, in Tennessee, you know, moving out um, into, the, into the Northwest Territory. But the Irish are the, is the first immigration that's so poor that they can't even purchase land, right? And so they become an urban population working in, in the ports, working in the new mill towns um, in, in the north. So the Irish immediately um, head into Boston and New York and Philadelphia, right? Um, so as soon as the Irish show up, the English and the Scots see them as the um, terrifying uh, massive foreign immigration um, group that is threatening American identity, right? So the English along the eastern seaboard had seen the Scots as a terrifying foreign invasion and felt the need to, you know, send them out west in order to get them out of the eastern seaboard. But as soon as the Roman Catholic Irish show up in the um, 19th century, the English and the Scots suddenly band together under a nice um, identity, um, umbrella identity of white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, right? Before they had seen themselves as distinct, English and Scottish, now suddenly they see themselves as united, English speaking and Protestant, right? And the Irish are seen as the, the foreign invasion. Um, now there is an enormous jump in American um, immigration statistics between the about 6,000 per year in the early republic. So the period between 1776 and say 1826, the first 50 years of the early republic, um, say from the 4th of July, 1776 to the 4th of July, 1826, because that's a, that's a nice round period, right? Um, because the 4th of July, 1776 is when Thomas Jefferson and John Adams both signed the Declaration of Independence and then um, 4th of July, 1826 is the day when both Tom, uh, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams died, right? So you get this nice, neat 50-year period of the early republic, right, when all of our presidents, our founding fathers, George Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, Madison Monroe, even John Quincy Adams is maybe a founder, right? Um, he's present at age 14 at the founding, right? So um, it's a nice, neat period. And in that period, you have about 6,000 immigrants per year, right? After the War of 1812, after the Irish potato famine, the immigration jumps to about 100,000 per year between the War of 1812 and um, the American Civil War, right? 
So that's a substantial leap, right? Um, American population is growing throughout that period at a very steady 30% natural increase, right? Um, we're a largely rural population and largely growing by natural increase rather than immigration, right? About 6,000 immigrants per year, about 30% growth, just natural growth. We've got a uh, um, very high birth rate. Family size is about 10, sometimes 15, sometimes 17, right? Very large um, birth rate, um, very, um, a, a, um, the child infant mortality is lowering and life expectancy is raising. And so we have a very high rate of natural growth of the population, not counting immigration, right? Um, but nevertheless, there is a, a significant and noticeable leap from the early republic, 6,000 um, immigrants per year to 100,000 immigrants per year in the period between the War of 1812 and the American Civil War, right? Um, and so you get the first, the first time America experiences nativism, right? And nativism at the time, the natives that they were talking about were not um, what we now call Native Americans, right? They were not the Indians, right? Um, they were about, at the time of the American founding, actually, sorry, let me just give you this um, piece of information to kind of put in your head. At the time of the American founding, 1776, there were 3.5 million Americans. That's 3 million from Britain, about 500,000 African slaves, and about 100,000 Native Americans very small portion of the population, Native Americans, right? Um, it's about 3 million British, about 500,000 African um, slaves, and then about 100,000 um, Native Americans. So just, that gives you a marker. 1776, we're at 3 million, 3.5 million, right? Um, so the first time we get a nativist movement, right? A violent, aggressive anti-immigration movement is in the period of the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, and nativism means in favor of the population of white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, the English who came over in the 1600s, you know, the, the Mayflower types, right? There are a lot of people in America who are descended from the Mayflower because of the enormous family size of the people who came off of the, the Mayflower, right? Um, if in every generation for 10 generations you have over 10 children, right, you can pretty much populate America, right? Um, so that, so <laughs> um, very high initial rate of, of natural increase, right? So it's really the, the English who came over in the 1600s, the Scots who came over in the 1700s, who are the nativists, right? Who are the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants objecting to the Irish Roman Catholics coming over after the Irish potato famine around 1845, right? Um, so, how am I doing? I've got, um, got 10 minutes left. That was actually what I would call immigration episode number one, right? And I said there were three, but I have a question whether three actually exists, right? So it was immigration episode number one, right? Ending in the anti-Irish Catholic nativism of the 1840s, 1850s, right? which Abraham Lincoln objected to. Abraham Lincoln objected to nativism, right? Objected to anti-Irish, anti-German agitation. Um, and Abraham Lincoln describes America before the American Civil War in the 1850s as the happy teeming millions of the American Midwest heartland, right? 85% rural, 35% natural growth rate, right? It's not growing primarily by immigration, it's growing pri primarily by family size and life expectancy, right? Um, so, so if you need a marker, right? So get your markers, right? We're just trying to give you a picture, right? 1776, 3.5 million, about 3 million British, and 0.5 or 500,000 um, African slaves. 
you move to the 1850s, we have jumped from 6,000 6, um, immigrants per year to 100,000 immigrants per year with the Irish immigration. So the Irish immigration is an event, right? Um, it's a kind of statistical event. But nevertheless, the majority of our um, population growth is still um, natural increase, native born, right? Um, so 1850s, Abraham Lincoln era, just before the American Civil War, happy teeming millions in the American heartland. We're settling the Northwest Territory, that's Indiana, Illinois, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Minnesota, this is, right, it's, you know, Ohio, right? Um, Ohio is always so important in American, um, in American elections, right? It's, it has never ceased to be important in American elections. It is the American heartland, right? So many of our presidents have come from Ohio, too. You always just sort of think of, like, fat Ohioans, you know, becoming president. Um, <laughs> all right. So we come to the period um, that you're holding in your hand. We come to the period of the Statue of Liberty and Ellis Island, right? What we usually think of as the, the centerpiece of the history of American immigration, right? The leap in American immigration after the American Civil War, right? Now, what's happening there, again, is push from Europe. If the instigator of immigration to North America throughout the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s was the rise of the modern nation state of Great Britain, the rise of the British Empire, what's going on between 1870, the Franco-Prussian War, and World War I, 1914, what's going on in Europe is the rise of three more nation states. And so you could say suddenly our immigration triples, <laughs> right? Because we're now dealing with immigration from three rising nation states and after the Industrial Revolution with railroads, with steamships, with telegraph wires, that centralization and consolidation of power in a modern nation state can go a lot faster. And so Italy, Germany, and Russia modernize, centralize, and consolidate power in the span of 50 years at a rate that the British had managed to do in three centuries, right? So the amount of population that you get coming over to the United States from the 1500s from England, 1600s from England, right? Um, 1700s from Scotland and 19th century from, Ir from Ireland, right? This is as the as the British are slowly modernizing and consolidating, right? But when you see the modernization and consolidation of Italy, right? And so you have to think of the Italian Risorgimento, the consolidation of Italy. There was no such thing as the modern nation state of Italy before 1870. It was positively medieval, right? Um, separated out into all of the different little states in Italy, the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, the Kingdom of the Piedmont, the Papal States, the independent cities of Venice and Florence and Milan, right? So it was very broken up into different sovereignties. Um, and it, it took the entire 19th century to consolidate um, the Italian peninsula into the modern nation state of Italy. And they finally captured Rome in 1870 to take as their capital, and the Pope became exile in the Vatican, right? So you have the process of the Italian Risorgimento going on throughout the 19th century, creating the modern nation state of Italy. At the same time, you have Kulturkampf going on under Bismarck in Germany and the creation of the modern nation state of Germany, the German Empire. Um, there had been no such thing as Germany at the beginning of the 19th century. You have Austria, you have Bavaria, you have Saxony, you have Prussia, you've got, you know, I uh, can't even say it, about 30, 40 different um, German states, right? Um, it's an incredible multiplicity of sovereignties, right? Um, and throughout the course of the 19th century, through various and sundry wars, it's all compacted together under Prussian military leadership. Um, and then turned into a single unified state, right? Similarly, right, Russia is starting to consolidate power over partitioned Poland, over parts of the Ukraine, um, and expelling groups that are not Russian. There's a kind of process of Russification going on in 
in Russia. And this is where you get pogroms against the Jews, like you see in um, Fiddler on the Roof, right, with Tevya. Um, hopefully you've seen Fiddler on the Roof with Tevya. If not, God help us. American cultural literacy is not what it should be. Um, right, so in that period, right, in that period, American immigration jumps again from 100,000 per year during the immigration of the Irish, during the Irish potato famine years, to hitting its one million per year mark during the period around World War I. Right. So during the period of around World War I, it's an interesting conflict confluence of things going on with regard to American population, right? You've got, we hit 100 million total population for the first time. We hit 1 million immigrants per year for the first time. But population growth dips below 20% for the first time. So if it's a 30% natural increase in the 1850s, happy teeming millions having large families, right? It's already gone down by 1870 to 20% natural increase. And by World War I, it's dipped below 20% natural increase. And we've become much more urbanized, right? So if the happy teeming millions in the Midwest were 30% natural increase, is this making sense? Yes? I, sorry to be just throwing stats at you in a, <laughs> in a random way, but I hope this is making sense. 30% um, natural increase, right? Large family sizes and 85% rural. Around World War I, the population has gone from the 3.5 million of 1776 to 100 million right, at World War I. So it's hit that. I'm, I'm intrigued by the, the numbers that we hit, so it sounds big, right? 100 million sounds big, right? And we've hit 1 million immigrants per year. But natural increase has dipped below 20% and has become 50% urban. We've just hit that, that turning point, right, from being 85% rural to being 50-50 rural-urban in World War I, right? Which means that the immigrants coming in are felt, right, not only have they just hit um, one million per year, but they're also felt as a larger proportion of the population because of the dip in the natural increase. We should put this, the increase of our population is um, more immigrant, right, than, than native increase, right? And it's being felt that way also because more people are living in cities where the immigrants are, right? And so you start to get the first laws limiting immigration um, between World War I and World War II. 1924 is an important um, law limiting immigration and also limiting the numbers of immigration, but also limiting um, nations of origin, right? Limiting immigration primarily to Europe and preventing immigration from Latin America and Asia. Okay. Um, so, if you'll allow me, right, this is... Um, Immigration event number one is white Anglo-Saxon Protestant immigration from the British Empire responding to Irish immigration, which is coming from the same place for exactly the same kinds of political and economic reasons as nativist to a foreign born population. Right? The second um, immigration event is the, what I would call the Statue of Liberty event, the Ellis Island event, um, the response of 
a primarily English-speaking people, suddenly we think of ourselves as the English-speaking peoples, right? If you think of Winston Churchill's um, series, History of the English-Speaking Peoples, we start to think of ourselves as the English-speaking people, so suddenly the Irish are included, Catholic or not Catholic, right? Um, suddenly the Irish are part of the natives because they're English-speaking, and the Italians, the Poles, the Russian Jews, the Southern Germans who are coming over because of the consolidation of power in Italy, Germany, and Russia are seen as foreign-born. Um, if you'll excuse me um, for this horrendous phrase, Henry Adams describes um, the new immigrants who are coming over, the kind of immigrants who are on the bottom deck of the Titanic on these new vast steamships, right, um, as reeking of garlic and snarling in weird Yiddish, <laughs> right, is the sort of view of who's coming over, right? It's the Italians, it's the Poles, it's the Russian Jews, right? Um, so, um, 1965, it's a transformation in American immigration law, which further limits the numbers coming over, but gets rid of the national origins aspect of immigration law. Instead of limiting immigration to European immigrants and excluding Latin Americans and Asians, it's opened up. Right? And there's a greater emphasis, as you could see, there's a greater emphasis on family unification and on um, employer, um, employee visits, um, visas, right? Um, so instead of limiting it to nation of origin, it's limiting it to people who are coming over um, for family members or people who are coming over for particular types of jobs, right? Um, at the time, people predicted that this wouldn't change um, where immigration is coming from, but in fact it has an it's, a, it's had an enormous effect on where immigration is primarily coming from. And immigration is primarily coming from um, Latin America and Asia now and no longer primarily from Europe. Um, but in order to finish, I just want to put an enormous question mark on whether the post-1965 shift from European immigration to Asian and Latin American immigration constitutes a third immigration event in American immigration history. And I'll tell you the reason why I doubt it, why I'm a little bit of a, it's horrible to say, I feel this is gonna be radical and hopefully provoke a little bit of conversation. I'm, I'm an immigration crisis skeptic. Um, <laughs> because the number of annual legal immigrants coming over in 2019 is one million per year. Now, we hit the one million per year number back in World War I when we had a population of 100 million. If we have one million per year immigrants in the year 2019, when we have over 300 million population, right, it doesn't seem to me to constitute the same kind of magnitude of event as the Statue of Liberty event, right? Um, we have half a million illegal immigrants so I might um, concede that we might have an illegal immigrant event, right? Um, but it still doesn't seem to constitute an enormous leap in immigration vis-a-vis -vis the total population of the United States in 2019, right? Um, so we might have an illegal immigration event, right? But I don't know that we have an immigration writ large crisis. If you, if you look at numbers of immigrants per year, and total American population in 2019 and compare it to what we were dealing with in World War, around the period of World War I, um, which in terms of the number of immigrants per year and the total American population which mu was much greater. So I'll leave you with this thought. Um, if we don't have an immigration crisis, we do have a crisis of another sort 
we have a demographic crisis. Because if we were happy teeming millions with 30, 35% natural growth rate in the 1850s, Lincoln's America, and that natural increase dipped below 20% during World War I, <laughs> I, can, I can barely say it out loud, it's so shocking, right? Our natural rate of increase in 2019 is 6.5. 6% natural rate of increase. So while we may not have an immigration crisis, we do have a demographic crisis of a lack of natural increase of our native born population. So that might, we, maybe we need a, another conference to talk about the demographic crisis. Um, so I, here I am over here, a little immigration crisis skeptic, okay? I'll, I'll finish there. 